I'd like to introduce my co-moderator, Dr. Susie Liu. She is professor of medicine and um, director of clinical services at George Washington Medical Facility. And Dr. Liu will be conducting the question and answer portion of the session. And I'm pleased to introduce the esteemed panelists, each, each a staunch patient advocate and um, in their own right, um, they have just always been very forward leaning and are what patients want, someone that is very interested in patient outcomes and is moving the needle forward. So we have Dr. Carolyn Newland, who's chief of renal devices branch, a division of reproductive gastro renal and urology devices at the US Food and Drug Administration, and the first recipient of AAKP's National Public Service Award. We have Dr. Bruce Culleton, Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of CVS Health. We have Dr. Cheval Roy, Professor at the Department of Bioengineering and Therapeutic Sciences at the University of California, San Francisco School of Pharmacy and Director of the Kidney Project. And Dr. Victor Guru, world-renowned board-certified internist and nephrologist, researcher and innovator of the wearable kidney. Um, Dr. Newland and the rest, I'd like for you to come up and I'd like to welcome you to the mic to start it off. And on a personal note, each one of them is a very, very good friend, so I'm very excited to be able to work and moderate this panel. I think you're gonna be excited about the information that we're about to, they're about to share with us. And I'll turn the mic over to Dr. Newland to get it started. Good morning, everybody. I want to uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. I think having the FDA here is, is an important part of, um, of what our role is at FDA. Our role is with getting, moving innovation forward. And um, I think it's important that I join a panel of, of products that I regulate, uh, which is the next three speakers you'll be talking to recently, uh, right after I finish today. So I'll get started today. As I said, I am Carolyn Newland. I am with the Food and Drug Administration, and I'm in the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. <clears throat> and please excuse me, I am very hoarse right now. I've had a cold. So if I don't lose my voice, we'll get through this today. So what I would really like to talk about a little bit is about how FDA is helping to move innovation forward. Um, the mission at the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, which is the part of FDA that regulates medical devices, their actual mission is to protect and promote public health. When we originally started, it was to protect, but now we are moving into the world of, of promoting. And how are we going to do that? And I'd like to spend today a little bit of time explaining that to you. Um, I'd also like to say that the focus on CDRH's role in promoting public health is making sure that patients are at the heart of everything that we do. CDRH's mission may be protect and promote, but our vision is that patients in the U.S. will have access to high quality, safe and effective medical devices of public health, and health importance first in the world. That's a very big mission since there's a lot of people out there in the world who are tackling this problem. So when I say a problem, I, I, I'm here to talk a little bit about the problem and the solutions. And I'd like to, to um, mention quickly that a few weeks ago I was talking to a friend of mine who works in cybersecurity. And this individual told me that when they tackle these really strange problems, and there's a lot of problems in cybersecurity today, that, that they take their problems to their supervisor. And the supervisor looked at him and, and said, well, what, you know, what is your problem? He said, well, I can't fix it. He says, yes, you can. He says, now look at me. He says, are you the problem? Part of the problem, are you part of the solution? Because if you're part of the problem, get out of my way, and I will take people that are part of the solution. And, and that struck with me because I think that's what FDA is trying to do today. We are trying to get beyond the fact that people think we're a barrier to innovation and we're the problem. We would like to make ourselves sort of the solution. And the, there's a lot of initiatives that are ongoing at the Food and Drug Administration, and I will talk about the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, that I think are starting to solve the problem, or at least be a part of the solution so that we can make sure innovation moves forward. So what is the challenge that's before us? The FDA, the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, has 1,800 <clears throat> has 1,800 dedicated individuals that help out with the regulation of medical devices. And that sounds like a lot of people, but we have 190,000 regulated devices that we must oversee and constantly modify, approve, and, and regulate. Um, within that 190,000 medical devices, there are 18,000 medical device manufacturing firms, 
and there are 21,000 worldwide device manufacturing facilities, many of which we have to inspect and, and oversee the regulatory processes involved with them. That's a big challenge. And if you look at the challenges that are before us with renal disease, we have a lot of medical devices that are out there to treat renal disease, primarily end-stage renal disease, looking at the dialysis process. But in 1962, when we had these processes developed, a patient was hooked up to a machine laying in a bed with their blood coming out of their body, cleaning their body. In, in 2018, we're still doing the same thing. This is the challenge that's before us. We see a lot of medical devices at FDA that are um, incremental improvements in the process. And we appreciate that, and we think those are very important. But what we want to see is, is destructive, new, disruptive processes that move innovation a lot faster. It's easy for us to sit and look at devices on a regular basis, day in and day out, that just do the same thing. Our job would be easy. We'd rather look at things that are complex and moving forward. Um, the other problem with FDA is we have many devices, as I said, to regulate, and we divide those into multiple classes. We have class one, class two, and class three. The highest class are our high-risk devices. Innovative devices fall under that high-risk section. Um, class two devices are sort of what we call our Me Too devices. They're devices that come into the to FDA. We look at them. We say, are you substantially equivalent to another device that's out there? We get a lot of information. Only about 10, 15 percent have clinical trials because they have a little bit of a new technology. They're those incremental improvements that we see on a regular basis. But then we have devices that are, that are more high risk. They have new innovative products. And those are our class three devices. We have a much more rigorous process. We're much established reasonable safety, reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness to regulate those products. And those products take a lot longer. We have a lot of clinical trials. And sometimes we have products that fall in between. They're new innovative. They, they have new, new processes involved with them. However, we think they might be a more moderate risk. And we have a process called the de novo process. Um, and those are where we are looking at special controls that will assure that those devices remain uh, reasonably safe and, and, and effective. Uh, so these are uh, the challenges that FDA is having to overcome in order to move forward with innovation. So a number of years ago, I'd say approximately 10, we decided on a new strategic plan for innovation. And this plan is sort of divided into three main categories. One is to revolutionize what we do, that the evidence generation paradigm and how we collect the data and the information to make these innovations uh, move forward, uh, we should change that. We also said we should transform the device regulatory process and the framework on how we look at medical devices. And the third is how are we going to involve the role of the FDA. One of the ways that we began was we decided to look outside of the FDA and form public-private partnerships. And there's a few of them on this slide. I'll talk about these three. But there are many other public-private partnerships that FDA has, has developed um, over the last 10 years. And I think these have really helped to move what we do and how we regulate products forward in a very quick way. The first one that came to, uh, to my appreciation was the Medical Device Innovation Consortium. And this is a public-private partnership created with the sole objective of advancing regulatory science of medical devices to more effectively and effic efficiently bridge that gap between all the components, industry, government, and nonprofits, including patients and academics, um, so that we could move innovation forward. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those products in a minute, some of those pr um, projects that this group has worked on. The second uh, uh, public-private partnership I've been involved in, which directly affects uh, kidney health, was the Kidney Health Initiative. In 2012, we were approached by a group of, of academics from uh, University of North Carolina who said, hey, FDA, you know, I don't think that you're always thinking about kidney health when you approve medical devices. And it isn't just like what I do in the dialysis world, but it could be drugs. It, it could be any other device. It could be a cardiovascular device that when it's approved, it has an impact on kidney. And we weren't spending enough time thinking about the kidney and what's going to happen when that kidney fails. So we formed this Kidney Health Initiative, again, a public-private partnership, and this is between the American Society of Nephrology and the Food and Drug Administration. Um, and this brought together stakeholders uh, to foster innovation. That is its main purpose. And I think you heard a little bit about this yesterday morning in one of our first speakers, uh, Zach Cahill. Um, and so we have done a number of projects, and, and I could speak a whole day about the projects that we've been involved in with the Kidney Health Initiative, but the one that I would like to just mention briefly is one that was brought up yesterday when we talked about a new and another um, initiative, and uh, the Kidney X, and this is called the Technology Roadmap. <clears throat> 
the technology roadmap that we have recently prepared with the Kidney Health Initiative as the leading force behind it um, has been to look at new renal replacement therapies. And the goals of this new technology roadmap, and we're only in the phase one process for this, uh, was to spur innovation. That was one of our main goals, to um, encourage international um, orientation and multidisciplinary approach to looking at new renal replacement therapies to accelerate the adoption commercially of these types of uh, viable solutions to attract industry, academia, and, and investors into the area. Those are some of the main goals in developing this roadmap. And overall was to make sure patients are at the heart of what we do when we do invent new medical devices. Um, the future uh, of renal replacement therapy today is to make sure that we've improved the quality of the life of the patients. And uh, that was the first thing that we did when we started this project. Um, you are going to hear from three speakers uh, right after me, which will be involved in some of the aspects of this, those that enhance dialysis that we currently have, those that are developing portable wearable devices, and those that are working on um, biohybrid implantable types devices. We are also uh, tied up into this project is regenerative type of projects. And this roadmap is available for people to see. It is, it is out there so that we can look at how the current technologies can be improved in incremental parts to make a whole that re leads to a brand new product to improve the life of everybody. And when we developed this, this technology roadmap, we were also thinking of this new um, public-private partnership that has been developed between the, uh, the, health, the Department of Health and Human Services, which is our mother uh, 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 agency for the FDA, and also the American Society of Nephrology. Uh, the KidneyX, you heard about that yesterday, the KidneyX Accelerator, where there are a number of prize winners. This technology roadmap will be used to help in that process, and many FDA people have been um, also involved in the whole Kidney X um, initiative. Okay, so moving on to other types of ways that FDA and CDRH is really helping innovation, um, I'd like to talk about when we look at our products, we look at the total product life cycle. We look from the time that you come up with an idea about a medical device through the preclinical testing into the clinical, into the pre-market submissions that come out and into the post-market world. You have to look at the entire product, and then we start thinking about how can FDA help, how can any FDA uh, change their processes throughout all of these aspects to move innovation forward. Um, I will talk about some of those now. I'd like to start out with some that are involved more in the pre-market or the early phases after you've come up with your idea and you've done some pre-market testing. How do you get into humans? And the process that we have developed is a program called the Early Feasibility Study Program. And it is a process whereby we take people who want to volunteer. It's an informal program where in the early stage of development, you evaluate your device through small clinical studies. And this, the policies behind the early feasibility program are do you have the right testing at the right time? We don't need you to do everything you might need to develop a medical device when you're still only at the early stages of protocol development. It's a way to get some patients in a very controlled environment to get to look at a new medical device in a very controlled area. Um, it's possible then to leverage that early data to move into larger clinical studies. And it's a, a way to look at the unknown risks through more patient clinical monitoring and frequent detailed reporting on what's happening in those early feasibility stages. When we look at this program overall at FDA, we have seen that since 2014 when we began the program to 2018, we have seen a dramatic increase in the number of these submissions that have come in. They haven't all been approved because we, you know, we still are very concerned about safety. That is our key factor that safety is being monitored. So there is a certain amount of testing that has to be done. So, um, but we are moving forward and these in are increasing constantly. Um, I'll just bring your attention to the area in this area, which is the gastrorenal urological devices, and those are the products that are, I regulate uh, in the renal and transplantation area. And we have had a number of early feasibility studies go forward, and they have led to larger studies, eventually to pivotal trials, and some on to marketing applications. Um, another way that we've been innovating with uh, new products is we started in 2012, around the same time we started the Kidney Health Initiative, what we called the Innovation Challenge. We had entrepreneurs come into FDA, they worked with us, they talked to us about how to change our processes, how to improve, and one of the areas they knew 
right at the beginning that we needed renovation was renal, the renal area. So we put out a challenge thinking we'd get 10 applications that would come in, people that would come and we would work with them very interactively to develop their products. We got 32 applications, which blew us away, and we knew we could only pick three, and which was a very difficult process. But we did pick those three, and I'm happy to say that two of those speakers will be speaking today because we're still looking at those devices. They're still breakthrough devices, they're still innovative, and they're still being developed. But we are continuing to work with them, and that is our wearable kidney and our implantable kidney. So the program for um, innovation was a, was a wonderful program. Everybody enjoyed it at the FDA, and we, we broadcast it throughout the rest of FDA, and obviously Congress heard also. And what happened was that people decided, well, we should evolve this program so that all of, of the Center for Devices and Radiological Health would use this program. And we called it the Early, early um, Access uh, Development Program, um, EAP. And I don't know why this is not going forward, but anyway. Um, and in this program, we then got the ear of Congress, and in the 21st Century Cures Act that was recently passed, they also decided Breakthrough Products would be the name for this new product. So we now have a program called Breakthrough. It's a permanent program at the FDA, and it, it is, is to help patients have more access to devices earlier in development. It is to expedite device development, and we work with sponsors to develop their roadmap on how they're going to develop their medical devices as they move forward. These are mostly our higher risk devices, but we have been putting some 510K type devices, our Me Too devices in it, if they have a technological uh, ev evolution that we need to look at more closely. So who's um, eligible to be a breakthrough product? Well, first, this device that you're going to put into this program and you apply for this program, it must provide a more effective treatment or diagnosis of a life-threatening or irreversibly, irreversibly debilitating human disease or condition. Everyone must meet that criteria. If you don't meet that, you can't be in the program. But on top of that, you must also meet one of four other um, criteria. They are, it must represent a breakthrough type technology. There must be no approved or cleared alternatives that exist for the technology. It should offer an advantage over current existing technologies, or these are ORs, the last four, or it's, it, the availability of it will be in the best interest of patients. That one actually is probably the easiest to meet. The first criteria is the hardest. We do need a little bit of evidence to show that your device truly is innovative um, and then it can be effective, potentially be effective. Uh, just looking at a glance how well this program's been received, um, we have had an increase in the number of these device, devices in the breakthrough program be approved over the years. We now have 149 applications throughout FDA that are approved as breakthrough technologies. It gives a number of advantages. We work very closely with these companies. We have what we now call sprint reviews. Within 45 days, we can review some aspect of their device. These companies come often. They come frequently to us so that we can talk to them and look through various stages of their development. And we ask them to come early and often, and they do. It takes a lot of time and effort, though. Um, in the renal area, we have a number of products. I believe it's down here. It's called GastroRenal because that's our advisory panel, urology. We have at least 10 products already in the breakthrough technology area within my group alone, which is the transplantation and renal devices area. Okay, I've mentioned, I haven't mentioned too much, but we have a program called Least Burdensome. Um, this is a program that has evolved throughout the years. It started in 1996, but has really taken hold in the more recent years. And the 21st Century Cures Act also had a part in it. Um, but it is basically a program where we, uh, we, pr we request the minimum amount of information necessary to adequately address a regulatory question or issue through the most efficient manner at the right time. And I know that a lot of people would like to say everything they give us is, is, is least burdensome. Sometimes it's not, or they're telling us we're not being least burdensome. Um, it does not, this law does not raise or lower the bar for what we can receive in information for an application that we're looking at. And it does not translate into I don't want to do it. I mean, we have a lot of those debates about least burdensome. Um, but the program is very successful, and we are taking it very seriously. It's built into our product development. It's built into our evaluation of our people, that they are making sure when they look at products that we're looking at them in a least burdensome way, not lowering the bar, and that's the hard line to, to cut. Um, I do want to say a couple other initiatives that we have, and I probably am running out of time. Um, we have the device uh, patient 
uh, preference initiative. This is a very big initiative at FDA, and we are applying that wholeheartedly to everything that we do within the renal space. Uh, this program has worked with the De uh, Medical Device Innovation Consortium. We have written products out there that you can, you can access, which talk about uh, statistical methodologies that can be used. We, we focus a lot in our patient preference initiatives on partnering with patients, developing patient-reported outcomes, doing patient preference studies to move the medical device products faster through the system, and we engage uh, patients in an advisory committee, which is specifically designed, and uh, Paul Conway is actually a member of that committee, and it is helping us to develop clinical trials that are very patient-centric. One of the examples of uh, uh, how we have used patient preferences in the renal space has to do with the solo home hemodialysis system. This dialysis system was normally used in the home environment. We had approved it and cleared it for the home environment. However, we required the fact that a, a partner had to be present when using this device in the home. And we had a, a lot of complaints from a lot of patients, and some of them are in this audience, saying that's not fair. We would like to, we feel we can do our dialysis alone in our homes. With, uh, Nick Stage, which is the owner of this device, came to us when we had a patient workshop. In 2015, we did, brought 110 patients and academics and researchers and industry together to talk about how to incorporate patient preferences into the renal space. Fantastic workshop that we had a lot of patient input. And one of the things that came out of that was that this was one device that we should think about. If patients want to do dialysis at home alone, we should let them. So we said, okay, next stage, go do a patient preference study, which they did. And they worked interactively with us. We brought our statisticians into the program. We worked through a program um, in developing the model that they used. They went out and did the study. And the evidence there was that patients felt that they really could do the dialysis at home, so we changed the labeling of this device. Now, it isn't for all patients, and I think that is a decision between the physician and the patient to decide if this is for them, but they're allowed now to do that if they are properly trained, and that is another thing, they had to be properly trained. And there's a lot of other uh, features added on this device that would help in the home so a patient could really learn and know how to use their device at home. And I would challenge the people who are inventing new home di dialysis devices to make those devices more patient friendly so that in the home, if we go that same way for patients to do their device t testing alone, their treatments alone, that they can use those, pro those systems without any problems. There are many other programs that we are developing within the FDA. Uh, the one thing I do want to highlight is that we are now living in a world of, of being able to accept more uncertainty in what we do. Um, we ask for, for an assurance, a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness when we approve a medical device uh, for marketing. That has not changed. However, we, it, we do want to make sure we understand that the word is reasonable and is not absolute assurance. We can never be absolutely sure the device is not going to cause a problem. We balance those risks. It's a benefit-risk analysis. We spend a lot of time on benefit-risk at the FDA, understanding, and, and we've built into it this understanding that uncertainty is part of it. And we what uncertainty can we live with? And patient preference studies can help us with that uncertainty. And we encourage those because it helps us decide what the trade-offs are that a patient is willing to accept when they are challenged with a complicated system that they're going to be using. Um, uh, the other thing that we are starting to do is we're accepting more real-world evidence, and there's a big program at the FDA now related to how do we collect world-world world data, and that's data from patients' health records and, and from their delivery of their care and how it's captured and with all of our patient reg uh, um, registries and, and information that's being collected now on electronic records, we are hoping that information can be used to help to help with product development. Um, world world evidence is how we use that patient data uh, to move forward. And under the right conditions, data derived from the real world sources can be used for regulatory decisions, but it does have to be collected in a way that helps regulatory decision making, and it has to be reliable data. Um, there, uh, there is one product that we actually have already cleared in the renal space using real world data. We had a cap, it's a, maybe a small device and it's a small step. We think it's very important. It was a small cap that you put on the end of a dialysis catheter. We had cleared this device, it has chlorhexidine in it, and we had cleared it because they had done a lot of bench studies showing that they could kill bacteria. It only stays out in the cap area. Um, so it got cleared, but then this company went out and decided to, to, to partner with the big dialysis clinics and a lot of other uh, dialysis groups, and to actually collect um, surveillance data, uh, which is normally collected by the Center for Device uh, CDC, 
but to use that data and collect it in a way that we could then probably use it to help with a new decision. So the company came to us. We didn't like their data very well at the beginning. They went back. They did a little bit more, and then they came back. And we then made a decision. We cleared a, the, this same identical cap with a new label. We now have said that using real-world data, they have supported a reduction in the incidence of central line-associated bloodstream infections. So that's what that data showed. Um, and I think it's, it's, just, it's a nice way to have used real-world data to move a whole product area forward. I know it's a labeling claim. It, it means a lot to companies. It means a lot to innovation and moving, moving products out there and a lot to getting investment money. But these are the incremental steps that we are trying to make to try to move innovation forward. Uh, the other part of getting real-world data is the FDA has another initiative, again, partnering with the Medical Device Innovation Consortium to develop a national evaluation system for health, te for health technology. And it's sort of a nesting area to try to get all the aspects of, of patient data together so that we can develop registries for data that can be used in the future, which, we will, which will be real-world post-market data that will help us. And in our decision-making process, Real-world data can be used in many places. It can be used in the area of, of, um, of clinical trials. It can be used in the way area of making clinical decisions for clinical care. And it can be used in the way of developing new preclinical ideas so that we can make, uh, develop the whole cycle again in product development. Uh, one other very brief uh, type of new innovative uh, process that we have in place is the Medical Device Development Tool Program. For those people out there that are developing validation tools that you can use to help measure something, to help develop a new device, this is a program for you. Um, it's methods, materials, uh, or measurements used to assess effectiveness, safety, or performance of a medical device. So it's being used to help another dev a device to get on the market. It's a whole program we have. It could be a microbiological test. It could be a materials test. It could be a whole variety of things. But this is another program that we are currently running. So the important thing for us that I want to end with is that we are here to communicate with the world. We, and I say the world because we communicate with the medical device companies from, from everywhere around the world. Our big goal is that we will be successful if we interact with people. We have many programs that are developed. We have a lot of guidance documents that are out there. I don't have time to talk about all of them, but all the programs that I have mentioned, including a variety of others, which I'll put on a list in just a second, have guidance documents. And we haven't just put a guidance out there. We think about it. We put it out. We get comments. And then we re revise it, and we put it out for a new one. That least burdensome guidance that started back in 2000, in, two, in, in in February of this year, we have a brand new version in 2019. I'm sure a lot of people don't even know it's out there. These guidances are coming out so fast that the review staff can't even keep up with them. There are a lot of them out there, and we're just trying to keep up with how things are moving quickly. Um, anyway, so as far as interactions, we have informational meetings. We have pre-submission meetings before a device, while device is being uh, uh, developed. We have interactive review processes that we, we keep going. We have post-market decision conference calls. We have submission issue meetings. If we're working with you on a submission, you don't like what we said, come back in and talk to us. We do those in a 21-day cycle. We have a lot of phone calls. We have a lot of interactions. Our goal is to interact to find the right way forward to keep innovation moving. Um, these are other programs which I do not have time to talk about today. They include more about our benefit risk guidance. We have a, a, a balancing of the pre-market and the post-market, how we move more things into the post-market realm instead of in the pre-market realm. We have a lot of programs in that area. We have adaptive design medical clinical trial product uh, initiatives that are ongoing. We have um, uh, NIH interactions that are ongoing with small businesses. We have the incubator accelerator project. We have gone out to look at new incubator accelerators. And I know that people are developing these tied to universities all over the place. And we have visited many of those out in California. There are a, num a lot of our people are meeting right now looking at the new innovative ideas that we can take back those ideas and how we can improve our processes so we can move innovation forward. We have a CMS parallel review program where the, where the Center for Medicaid and Medicare can be uh, looking at products at the same time that we're reviewing them so we can make sure that, they're, that our reasonable safety and effectiveness meet their reasonable and necessary um, or processes, their laws, so that the two processes are different, but they can come together in certain ways. And we also have a payer communication task force to help 
other payers for insurance come in and work with us and with you and with industry, with academics while products are being developed. We have other reg early regulatory assistance programs and of course we have our interactions with FDA. We have also done one more thing we've reorganized. I can't even tell you my title anymore because as of May 1st it just changed. <laughs> I became from a branch chief to an assistant division director for the Office of Product Evaluation and Quality. It's a whole new system. It's been done to help transform the Center for Devices and Radiological Health to a group that can look at the total product life cycle. Our group are now responsible for the pre-market and the post-market. We look at those post-market issues and what happens and we bring them into the pre-market realm and we work the two back and forth so we can move innovation quickly and more effectively. Um, I want to thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk. I could talk a lot more. If you gave me an hour, I'd tell you a lot more. <laughs> but I'd, uh, I would like to now let the innovators get up here and talk and tell you more about what they do. But I would like to end with saying that I'm hoping that we are starting to help with being the solution instead of the problem. We don't want to be the barrier at the FDA. We want to be those that help move innovation forward because it is important to patients that they are the key people. And I would say patients. It's people living with kidney disease not just patients, because a lot of us have kidney disease, and people who are out there, even on dialysis at end-stage le level, they need new products. They need new things that are out there that are going to help them live a better life. The quality of life is the most important thing, so they can carry on with their lives. They can go out and work. They can go and travel. They can raise their families. And I think the next speakers are going to tell you some ways that they can really do this. Thank you very much. Thanks, Carolyn. That was um, actually an awesome overview of, of, of your role and, and the activities within the FDA and how things are changing um, to uh, bring more innovation to the market, so thanks. And, and uh, thanks, Richard, for having me here as well and inviting me to speak at this session. So I'm going to talk today about making home hemodialysis a mainstream dialysis modality again. Um, and I think many of you may, um, knowing my background, many of you may think I'm going to talk about a device. And given that I'm in a session with two other device innovators, that would make a lot of sense. So I'm actually not going to focus too much on the device. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, a lot of other things that I think are needed to really move home hemodialysis forward. I'm going to start with some perspectives from patients. Um, some of this work comes from Alison Tong. So Alison uh, leads a group out of Australia that does a lot of qualitative work in patients across many different disease states. If you're not familiar with her work, I'd encourage you to go look at it. It's, it's some very insightful work on um, patient perspectives and experiences. And so these are some words from in-center hemodialysis patients. It's absolutely amazing what a person can get used to. Don't get me wrong, I'm grateful, I'm living, but is this really living? And then I feel guilty knowing that I have the sleep. That's in the context of going to a dialysis center, getting dialysis, feeling completely wiped out, and coming home and having to sleep and not contributing to family activities. And then finally, when they saw you, well, see you walking around, they're like, he's okay. And there was no appreciation of just how bad you did feel. So there wasn't that understanding. It was never there. Everyone was like sympathetic, but they could never relate to how bad you feel. And now I know we have some patients here today with us and many patients um, who are remote and listening. Um, and I know many of you feel this way about your care and your treatments at times. So a question then is, is the standard of care, which is really facility-based, three times per week dialysis, is there something inherently wrong with that paradigm? And there's obviously some medical data. There's lots of data presented yesterday. I'm not going to rehash a lot of that data. I think most of us are aware of many of the outcomes that we see in dialysis patients today, um, the high burden on costs. And then this is just the question, is a lot of this related to the fact that it's facility-based, which drives three times per week dialysis, which drives us going after certain clearance measurements, and does that contribute to some of the bad outcomes that we see 
and also how patients feel. Um, and so this is some data that was published several years back with highlight, which highlighted uh, concern with a two-day gap in facility-based dialysis. And in more detail, what the um, authors reported was associated with that two-day gap during a, a, a seven-day treatment period, there's always a two-day gap in treatments for facility-based dialysis. These are the risks that you see for the variety of different endpoints that they looked after. So there's a 90% increase in risk of arrhythmia associated with that two-day gap. Almost an 80% increase in risk for hospitalization for heart failure. It's nice to see that we are making progress on the policy front. We're not there yet. But at least the Secretary of Health and Human Services is recognizing in the U.S., I know this is a global summit, but in the U.S., the uh, Secretary for Health and Human Services is recognizing what problem we have today, not just on the patient experience, not just on the patient outcomes, um, but also obviously on the cost to our system. And many of those um, um, costs, therefore, if we're not able to reduce those, we're not able to reinvest that money back into innovation or back into better patient care. So the secretary recently said, there may be no better example of how outdated payment systems distort Americans' health care and lower its quality than we have in kidney care today. And I'm going to repeat what many people said yesterday, and that is the status quo was not acceptable. So the secretary and others within uh, CMMI and CMM CMS have gone on to say that as part of their goals by 2025, as they think of re-envisioning kidney care, is that um, they anticipate, part of their goals is that 50% of new patients will be on home dialysis by 2025. We've got 12% today in the US. So 50% of new dialysis patients. And another publicly stated goal was 50% home dialysis and 30% transplants, or a total of 80% that essentially received some form of treatment in the home. Um, and, and those are um, audacious goals, I would say. Those are goals that I think are gonna be very difficult to hit. Um, but I believe that with the right incentives, we can certainly move significantly in that right direction. Now, as part of growing home dialysis, we know that peritoneal dialysis is one choice, home hemodialysis another choice. I think they're complementary. Um, you can't have one and get to that 50%. You really need to have two of, two of those therapies and maybe other therapies to get more patients home as well. Um, the past for hemo home hemodialysis um, was actually quite successful. And in 1973, when the Medicare in-stage kidney disease program began, 40% of all patients in this country were on home hemodialysis. In some other countries today, home hemodialysis is actually very common. We think about Australia and New Zealand, for example, home hemodialysis is actually practiced quite commonly in some centers, in some centers, though not all, it's as high as 50%. Um, in 1980, uh, facility-based, by that time, hemodialysis had grown, as did PD and home hemodialysis use dropped to 5%. Um, and then just before next stage was introduced to the market in the early 2000s, only 0.5% of all patients were treated on home hemodialysis. So a significant change over time. And honestly, even since next stage was introduced, um, we really still haven't seen a significant uptake in home hemodialysis. And what I'm gonna talk about today is, is some of those barriers and how maybe we can break them down. But even today, there's only just less than 2% of all patients on dialysis who are treated in the home with home hemodialysis, despite an innovation that Next Stage brought to the market. Now, one often, I think, in this context is to say, well, is part of that related to the clinical benefits? Is there evidence to actually support more home hemodialysis? And it's really in the home where you can perform more frequent dialysis or you can perform longer dialysis. I'm not going to go through the medical benefits in detail. Um, here is an example of four randomized trials in this area. They've shown, uh, for the most part, 
um, improvements in things like urea clearance, which honestly I don't think means a whole lot. Um, but then you also see improvements in blood pressure, uh, phosphate clearance, uh, phosphate reduction, uh, decrease in medications for blood pressure and phosphate, a uh, host of other things, including regression of left ventricular hypertrophy, and some selected measure improvement in quality of life. There, like everything, there is a risk. Um, there is a signal for increased vascular access events, which may come with more frequent needling. Um, but the benefits have been shown across multiple different randomized controlled trials. Um, the number of patients in these uh, trials are low compared to large randomized studies on the drug side, um, which may be thousands and often tens of thousands of patients. Combined, the number of patients enrolled in these randomized trials are probably less than 500. And then there's some observational data. This is a bit older data, but the observational data, at least from this study, uh, showed that um, a nocturnal frequent home hemodialysis led to um, long-term survival that was similar to a cadaveric transplant. Um, I wouldn't advocate um, nocturnal home hemodialysis over transplantation. I think transplantation is the gold standard and we should be doing everything we can to improve that. But I think this just illustrates that the long-term outcomes with longer, more frequent treatments um, can, be, um, can be improved. Um, and then one, one of the studies that actually really speaks to why some of these benefits may occur uh, is, is, a, is a simple um, case series of women who became pregnant while being treated with long nocturnal dialysis. And not only did they get pregnant, but they carried um, the baby to term and delivered a healthy baby. And if you go to um, Dr. Chris Chan's unit in Toronto, um, within their training unit, um, they have a board that's full of pictures of newborns newborns that um, um, were delivered from women that were in their program and were treated in this way. So this really, I think, speaks to the physiology changes that you can occur with longer treatments. So those are the clinical benefits. And then if you ask a lot of doctors or nurses, you know, which therapy do you think delivers the best dialysis? Um, most of them will say, well, it's more frequent dialysis, so it's more frequent longer dialysis. Well, why are less than 2% of people doing this? Um, it's not because a lot of people don't believe um, in the benefit of the therapy, but less than 2% of all patients in the U.S. are doing this. So these are some frequently stated barriers to the adoption and growth of home hemodialysis. Some of this comes from well, you could put a group of people in a room and come up with these barriers, um, but some of this actually comes from a, um, a home dialysis conference that was sponsored by the Kidney Foundation, the National Kidney Foundation. It was a Kedoki home dialysis conference, and they've published this. This was published last year, um, and they've also had a subsequent workshop to try and deliver um, some output related to how do you solve for these barriers. I'm going to run through some of these and then focus on a couple which I think are extremely important. So just running through them, um, there's a lack of confidence amongst physicians who don't feel comfortable prescribing um, home hemodialysis. Um, and there's also a lack of confidence from physicians that their patients can't do it. Um, and I think that's very, very important that many doctors, many nephrologists believe today that the evidence is there that I would put my mother or father or brother or sister on home hemodialysis, but I don't think my own patients can do it. They're different. There's also a lot of churn in home dialysis in general. In the median time on therapy for PD is about 24 months. So if we're really going to grow home dialysis, we need to solve for that. We also need to have a, a mechanism for patients to stay home once they come off PD and move on to home hemodialysis. And even in home hemodialysis today, um, the churn is significant. Um, on average, I think today, two people need to be trained in order to have one person still on therapy at the end of the year. That's very difficult to grow a program. Um, and the other thing that we've heard significantly over and over and over is that it is so easy to put a patient on infacility dialysis. 
Uh, it's one button, it's one phone call, and you could send a patient to a facility. Uh, it's much more challenging to actually grow a home program. Um, then there's, uh, um, there's, there are barriers around the operational, the lack of infrastructure, a lack of staff training. If you can't get a patient trained and you need that patient trained this week and it's a three month delay, again, it's, these are barriers that exist that limit the growth of not just PD but also home hemodialysis. Now what I think um, is one of the most important and significant group of barriers and maybe somewhat controversial are economic barriers. Um, and some of these barriers have also been raised by the, the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Um, and I think they do honestly want to correct some of these economic disincentives. So there are provider disincentives. So this is just the business model that exists today. If you've invested heavily in thousands of dialysis clinics, um, you need to fill those empty chairs. And the marginal cost for the next dialysis patient is really for that provider is to put someone in that chair. There are also therapy costs, and those therapy costs are associated with device and consumables, et cetera. For home hemodialysis, for the most part, um, those costs of therapy, device, consumables, training, et cetera, are not covered sufficiently by today's reimbursement. And then the patient time on therapy is something that has to be solved as well. Again, training two to have one on at the end of the year, that's a real problem, that's a cost, um, and it doesn't really provide an incentive for a provider to invest heavily in this space if they're gonna be losing money for each patient they put on home hemodialysis. Then on the physician side, so some of the stuff is where it's not so controversial and others where they are not so controversial is, you know, a, most people believe if you, if you really want to grow home dialysis, you move, need to move upstream. We heard this from Dr. Doug Johnson from DCI yesterday um, and Dr. Akinzi from Somatis yesterday, both of which develop programs, are developing, have developed programs to move upstream, which have an impact on patient education, patient empowerment, patient knowledge, and then patient choice around choosing home dialysis. Um, from a physician side, um, the reimbursement for physicians or their clinics to spend a lot of time talking to patients about this very complex problem, the reimbursement is insufficient today. On the other side, the dialysis um, per uh, member, per patient per month um, reimbursement for the physician is higher for, most, for the most part if your patient is in center as opposed to if you have a home patient. That doesn't incentivize growth of home. And then a lot of nephrologists get compensation by medical directorships and in facility units, as well as, and this was, this was highlighted in an editorial by Dr. Jeffrey Burns last year in the New England Journal, uh, a lot of joint venture positions that nephrologists have with dialysis clinics, in-center clinics and home clinics, but there's a proliferation of in-center facility-based joint ventures of nephrologists with providers. Now that's an annuity for the nephrologist. That's their retirement. They rely upon that unit being successful. And then of course, you also need to solve for some patient costs. So patients should not be out of pocket. If you wanna go home, you should not be out of pocket for your costs. Now finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about patient and caregiver related barriers. And I'm gonna, to start this with some perspectives from home hemo patients. And right at the bottom is something that Brian Hess said yesterday. Brian's a patient and spoke here eloquently yesterday around some of his experiences as a transplant patient and then a dialysis patient. And, and Brian said, home dialysis offers me flexibility and control. Others have said what you could see on the screen. Some of it relates to what people actually see. I saw others on home hemodialysis and looked better. Some people that are treated with longer, more frequent dialysis, honestly, they look different. Their skin color is different. They, they, they look like they're not a dialysis patient. And then you see some other comments here around improved relationships, being able to complete your education, being financially independent, full and a normal life, 
And then I'll, I'll finish with this one. I saw Home Hemo as a new beginning, and we saw benefits early on doing it at home. I have energy so we can go out on nights after my treatment. So these are just some comments from patients. And this work that comes from um, this uh, Alison Tong and her group, the qualitative work, they've also looked at um, patients and caregiver perspectives on home hemodialysis. And, and they present a schema for how to think about that. And, and, this, and, and the different themes that they've recognized are appreciating medical responsiveness, vulnerability of dialyzing independently at home. These are challenges for patients. And this is what patients have said, and they've put these into these different buckets or themes. A concern for my family burden, a fear of being alone. Um, and the other theme is an opportunity to thrive. And so um, what they present is a construct for how we can move more people to actually feel comfortable and give them that opportunity to thrive. Everything from how do we become more medically responsive as physicians, as nurses, as clinics? How do we monitor attentively and communicate with patients to reduce their fear of being alone? Um, and then there certainly are some other challenges, some of which can honestly be solved by better technology and a device. So catastrophic complications, for example, we should be designing devices that really reduce the risk substantially around bleed outs. Take that out of patients' hands. Um, and then obviously there are concerns around family burden. There are things that we can do on the service side that can help patients reduce that burden as well as on the caregiver side. So um, I'm, I'm now working at CVS Health and I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes to say that we're thinking through some of these barriers and trying to design some solutions to help patients um, either delay progression of their kidney disease, facilitate more transplants, or if a patient does need dialysis, then how do we support them um, in the home, both PD and home hemodialysis? Uh, and you see some of this uh, on the slide. Um, I would like to comment on a couple of things, and, and the CEO of Somatis and, and the chair of uh, DCI talked about this at length yesterday. One is the importance of CKD management. Um, and, uh, and Francesca got up and asked a question yesterday too and said, well, this is an innovative. People have been doing this for a long time. I mean, educating patients about their kidney disease and empowering them and going into their homes, that happens today. That's been happening for 20 or 30 or 40 years in other countries. And honestly, it's not innovative. What's innovative is actually trying to create a payment structure that reimburses the good behavior, that this should be done. And it's a shift in how we actually compensate for that behavior. The other thing that I think is novel, and many of us can do, and I know Somatis is also doing this, is how do we take the data that's available today, identify patients that have kidney disease, but they don't know they have kidney disease, so how can we take health data and reach out to those patients to make them more aware? And awareness is a big problem. And then the other is how do we develop interventions and make sure they're targeted to the highest risk individuals at that right time in their journey? Um, and we think we can do that and others can do that using um, advanced analytics or deep learning techniques. So it's really a matter of taking all that data that comes from a patient and that patient, as you follow that patient in over in time, recognizing when their risk changes and intervening appropriately when that risk changes. Not all patients that have stage four kidney disease are at risk of developing kidney failure in the next 18 months. There's some people that will re remain very stable and some people that precipitously drop off and end up in dialysis or an emergency room or a hospital. How do we predict that? We think there are tools today that can help us with that. And then finally, I want to build on something that um, Dr. Barry Smith from Rogerson said yesterday. And, and Dr. Smith was being a bit provocative when he was talking about healthcare in general. He didn't use the term behavioral economics, but um, that's kind of what he was talking about. 
Um, and this, this tries to answer, and, and, I, and maybe I'll back up just for a second. Everything I talked about, barriers and CKD management and better technology, better support in home, et cetera, giving patients options for their therapy, I think that's only going to get us so far. Right? Even within the best systems in the world, the best health systems in the world, you're getting penetration of home dialysis, unless it's home first policy like Hong Kong or Mexico was for a while. But outside of that home first policy, you're getting penetration of 30 to 40 to 50 percent. 50 percent would be really the highest that you see other than Hong Kong, which had a PD first, and Guatemala, which I think also had a PD first. You know, other than those countries who say economically, we've made a decision that we can't support everyone with kidney disease unless we have a certain therapy that's the only option for the patient. But we don't live in that country, so we need to give patients choice. So the only real way then is, you know, we'll get to a certain point with ideal reimbursement systems, more education for doctors, better experience, more education for patients. But then, as we all know, we also have these issues. So why do people fail to exercise when they know there's a benefit to it? Why do some patients skip their medications that prevent serious illness after they've had a heart attack within the first week of going home? Why do some physicians stick to their usual practices despite ample evidence that there's better approaches? How come they don't follow guidelines? Why have, why have pay for performance programs not always been successful? So this is really challenging. There's a whole science behind this. And I don't think we address this within the field of kidney disease. And this is also something that we need to address to really get to that 50% 50, 50 point. Just, just a couple of notes I have here on behavioral economics. They believe that patients and physicians are predictably irrational. I think so too, right? So we're rational, but we're also predictably irrational. And a key principle of behavioral economics is, is that we rely upon loss of, um, on loss aversion. We are a lot more sensitive to losing something, especially in the short term, than the possibility of gain. And how do we turn that around into something that we could use in growing home dialysis? So I'm gonna leave it um, with this slide. Um, this is a, a very, very complex problem. Um, some of the barriers are easy to speak to. I think we all recognize what some of the barriers are. Um, some of them honestly can be addressed with better technology, whether that's the device or whether that's connectivity in the home. I think telehealth is gonna move the needle, but it's not gonna be enough. Whether it's artificial intelligence to help um, identify and risk predict, and even, for example, predict who's gonna be better off on PD versus home hemo. When should we intervene in a PD patient and actively coach them on moving to home hemo? So all that stuff, I think, can be helped with more and more data. Um, and then the economic incentives, I really think HHS is making some progress and see the need for, for substantial changes in this space. Um, and, and finally, I mean, two other big cogs are operational support. I think these are addressable. If there's money behind it, this is gonna happen. Um, and then finally, how do we solve for some of this other decision making that we all have as individuals? This is a complex space. We all make these decisions that's not necessarily directed at improving your health. So thanks for your time. So thank you to the <coughs> George Washington group here and the American Association of Kidney Patients for having uh, the courage to invite me and talk about it from, from a very different perspective, which is a device and technology theme. Uh, and coming from an engineering perspective rather than a clinician perspective. So we'll talk about our device that's been in the works um, for some time that started out as a concept. And the concept was driven by a vision that we can do something beyond dialysis. And the gold standard, as we heard, <laughs> is transplant. Can we get to something that provides the benefits of transplant despite the severe limitation of organs. So we are driven by this vision to build an implantable device 
that will be surgically located in the abdomen <coughs> and provide a number of benefits of a transplant organ. So this was the vision that drove us from years back. And we then, with our team, started working backwards to see how we might achieve this. So our proposed device is a combination of mechanical ultrafiltration that's achieved by a filtration unit we call the hemofilter, and couple that with cell therapy to provide a, a number of the other metabolic functions of a native kidney. And over the years, we've been working at this device from a number of directions and working with my colleagues at Vanderbilt University, led by Dr. William Fizel, we've the project has colloquially become called the Kidney Project. And the goal is to deliver an implanted renal, therapy, uh, renal replacement therapy device that will provide continuous treatment, allow the patient to be mobile, the vision is they can eat and drink what they want, and in the ultimate case, actually not have to use immunosuppression drugs. So we start from that principle of engineering and work our way backwards. It's not based on let's go do some basic studies and then try to figure this out, but let's take the advances that have come out of basic science, supported by NIH, supported by NSF and other agencies, and see how we might advance this concept towards reality. So as we look at this, how do we go about thinking about this device? Well, we are basically trying to recapitulate the kidney, and specifically the kidney nephron. So I've said that we try to achieve filtration and basically mimic the functions of the glomerulus and achieve highly selective ultrafiltration. So to do that, it's instructive to look at what we have for filtration today, and that's the regular dialyzer. And here is a single hollow fiber that's in a dialyzer. And if one takes a closer look at the structure of this, these are made from polysulfone or other polymer materials. They tend to have fairly thick porous walls. The materials over time clot, as we know, and they also degrade upon exposure to blood. And that's the state of the art of a hollow fiber dialyzer that we've had that started off in the late 60s to what we have today. Clearly, the workhorse of all dialysis systems. It may be interesting to see what the natural hemofilter in our kidneys are structured as. So here's a histology image on the top left, a scanning electron micrograph of the glomerular filter capsule, and then a transmission electron micrograph of the actual filtration section. And what's interesting to note is that this looks very different than what I just showed you. So first of all, we've got a much thinner filtration uh, uh, structure. Instead of being 30, 40 microns that the wall of a hollow fiber is, this is just 100 nanometers or less. So to, for those who are doing the math, that's about an order of magnitude less. Secondly, as that middle picture shows, the spores in the filter are not holes like you might think of in a colander. They're actually long, uniform, slit-shaped pores, and they're highly uniform in size. They tend to range in between 5 to 10 nanometers ac across the, the TEM images that I've seen. And you can see that they're formed by these food processes. And the question is, maybe the reason dialysis doesn't provide all the types of functionality, maybe associated with the, the clearance of dialysis membranes may not be as biomimetic as what our native kidneys are. So how about we think about building a filter that mimics the kidney's glomerulus? So to do that, we have to build a structure that achieves uniform slit pores at that size scale. 
the technologies of polymer construction are not really amenable for creating structures like this. So what we did was to look at silicon, semiconductor silicon technology, the same used to make our electronics, highly precise, in bulk, low cost, and smart with electronics, and see if we can apply the technology to creating membranes. So we take advantage of the established infrastructure the semiconductor companies have evolved over the last 50, 60 years. So we are going to now take that technology that's highly manufacturable, allows precision, and can f build structures at nanoscale and build a filter. And so here's our effort. So here's a silicon wafer that we've constructed using these technologies to build the next generation of membranes. And let's look at how these membranes perform. So here's a scanning electron micrograph. On the bottom left is a top view. On the right-hand side is a cross-section. Very, very different than the hollow fiber membrane. For one, we have these pores that are highly uniform and slit-like. They're highly parallel and slit-like. I don't have this uh, thickness on the slide, but the thickness of that membrane that you see is about 500 nanometers. Contrast that to 40 or 50 microns, so about 100 times thinner than a polymer membrane. Not only that, but we can control the pores so that they're all very uniform. What does this mean? Well, by making the membrane very thin, and using this build to put the pores closer, we can achieve a high hydraulic permeability. That's engineering speak for how much flux you get through the membrane for a given amount of driving pressure. Why does, what does this mean? It means that we can use a lot less surface area than a conventional dialyzer, or we could actually use a lot less driving pressure than what is required to drive blood through a hollow fiber membrane. For us, that manifests in, in, into a compact filtration unit that's about one-tenth the surface area of a dialyzer. So a typical dialyzer, 1.5 to 2 square meters, we can achieve the same amount of clearance with about 0.1 to 0.2 square meters. Moreover, because we require such little driving pressure, we can rely, rely on the heart to provide that energy to drive filtration and blood through the device and not rely on batteries or electrical connections to the outside. So now you have a system that will operate just based on blood pressure. Second, by being able to control the pores very precisely, you're able to achieve better clearance. We're able to achieve high amounts of middle molecule toxin removal without leaking albumin. And this is more mimetic of what our kidneys are than typical dialysis mm -hmm membranes that may leak albumin to get higher flux or retain some of the toxins by trying to avoid albumin leakage. But clearly, we're now bringing a new material and it has to contact blood. So we have to think about how do we address the material compatibility of our membrane with blood. So the approach we have taken is to learn from nature and basically modify just the surface of the membrane with molecules that are blood friendly but don't block the pores. So to that end, we have taken molecules that are well understood like polyethylene glycol, which is widely used in the medical device and drug encapsulation area, along with some other biomimetic molecules like oligosaccharides. In fact, in our blood vessels, lining the uh, and, uh, endothelial wall, we've got the cells that actually have sugar molecules. We can take that sugar molecule, oligosaccharides, and graft them onto the silicon membrane. So that's the strategy we're taking. And I'll show you what that manifests in practice. So here is one of our silicon devices that's not coated, and you can see a lot of cellular debris, red blood cells, platelets, other materials that have deposited on the surface. But if you're able to coat this with some of these types of molecules, here we've done a zwitterionic polymer called polysulfobethane methacrylate, we're able to resist 
the fouling and the thrombosis potential of these membranes. So now we have the potential to actually put a membrane that does not require anticoagulation if we design this right. So think about that. So now no pumps and possibly no anticoagulation. So let me take you to the other part of it, which is the cellular component. So that's very hard to engineer de novo, starting from all the engineering that we know. So we thought the best way to do this was to actually apply cell therapy. And the focus of our device is to actually provide dialysis independence as a first goal, which means that we would want the patient not to be able to require any dialysis or replacement fluid. So we focus on trying to mimic the function of the proximal tubule, uh, uh, proximal tubule to provide volume homeostasis. So that's our shorter term goal. We want to provide ultrafiltration and use the tubular component, specifically cells from proximal tubule, to selectively reabsorb water and other salts so that the patient has achieved a volume homeostasis and thereby allows them to lead a more normal life. So we've tested our membranes, the same membranes for filtration, for the ability of them to transport different types of solutes. We're using some highly uh, concentrated uh, solutions, we've been able to show that we can actually limit the passage of albumin and antibodies, minimal passage of cytokines, at least in this highly concentrated solution, but while allowing full transmission of solutes that are small, nutrients, oxygen, through these membranes. So here we have now a membrane that allows us to think about the possibility of avoiding the need for immunosuppression drugs just by tuning the pore size of the membrane and modifying the surface. So we've taken this idea and said, let us look at how to mimic the kidney cells. And one of the things that we discovered early on was this sends a, these cells are uniquely sensitive to shear conditions versus static conditions. So here's a typical experiment of growing kidney cells in culture that some of you in the lab may do. But once you put this under shear conditions, there's clearly a difference, and this not only manifests in terms of reorganized cytoskeletal, but also in transport properties. So this graph here at the bottom shows that if you apply shear, the cells behave different in what they transport, in this case, they, they transport uh, organic substrate through the cells. So we have to be able to recapitulate some of these shear conditions in our bioreactor component of the artificial kidney. And not only that, but the shear also affects the amount of water transport. And here's our first attempt at showing that by modulating the shear, you're able to change the rate of water transport. By optimizing this, we could possibly get to a stage where you do not need any replacement fluid, making sure that all the ultrafiltrate that comes out is processed by the bioreactor and only what is necessary to be concentrated gets out as urine. Furthermore, we've said with this knowledge, let's see if we can start building some perfusion flow bioreactors. We're actually building the systems that let us understand the, the conditions of flow that are optimal for these renal epithelial cells. And here you see some experimental uh, day, uh, setups we have, but basically the size smaller than a credit card that we're running experiments in parallel that allow us to achieve these conditions, but not only that, but we're also looking at growing these cells and maintain their phenotype on our membranes despite being exposed to a foreign uh, tissue, which is the patient's blood, or in this case, challenged by a number of the antibodies and cytokines. And this graph, this image, basically shows that we can maintain the tight junctions while also expressing the cytoskeletal uh, markers that these cells are used to doing in vivo. Not only that, but we're able to now sh start looking at the idea that we can keep the cells in our device functional 
for up to two months or more. And the challenge really being the experimental conditions. And this initial work was done with animal cells, but we're moving to human cells that can show that we can maintain a high level of immunoprotection or barrier function without losing phenotype for a fairly long time. So we're taking all this work on the filter and the cells, and now we're trying to put this into preclinical testing in large animals. So here is actually one of our devices, and I think I have a little 3D print. This is about the size we have. We're implanting this into uh, swine, and we're able, and you can, let's see if it comes up, and you might, you might actually sit around this little bulge. We're testing to see the key parameters. Can we actually let blood go through these membranes without clotting? Can we run cells without immunosuppression? And we've been successful for up to one month. We have run this without pumps, with no blood thinners. And clearly, with, we're able to show that we have patency of the blood vessels. Yeah. So that's right before explant, where there's an angiogram showing the blood flowing through the device, and the vessels are still patent after one month. This is important to us because we had been told, one, that membranes will survive blood, they'll clot. Second, they won't survive mechanically. These are very thin membranes. And three, you'll also have challenges with the animal reacting adversely because you have a foreign body. So we're taking this work together and moving to the next step, which is currently on, ongoing, which is to scale up the devices from the small prototypes I'm showing you to building large-scale clinically relevant sizes, integrating them to achieve a single unit that we can show continuous and reliable function. So our vision is driven by a device that does not require immunosuppressants, no anticoagulants, no need for dialysate replacement fluid, and no external connections through catheters. When able to achieve this, we'll have achieved a truly implantable bioartificial kidney. So let me end by thanking a lot of our supporters that range from the National Institutes of Health to the FDA through their Breakthrough Devices Program and Innovation Pathway Program, the Expedited Access Program, that have actually guided us to think patients first. And the patient advocacy groups, AAKP, Home Dialysis United, that keep us on the mission that we have to work towards the goal of providing a solution that works for kidney failure patients. And a number of our supporters that have helped us on the private side. So thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for having me here. I'm going to talk about wearable artificial organs a little bit and uh, their unmet needs and how are we going to hopefully meet the needs that are still pending. It would be nice if I can get this slide moving. There we go. Here are my disclosures. And uh, the unmet needs in wearable artificial organs uh, are basically known to everybody. And just a short summary, as a practicing physician, when I'm in the room and I break the news to somebody that dialysis is probably going to be needed, uh, it's a very tough experience that it can get very emotional. And the questions are, we get are, what can I expect? How long do I have before I'm gone? Does it hurt? Can I work? Do I need help? How am I going to pay for this? And the answers to these questions are unfortunately not very good as we are in front of a patient. And the goals, the unmet needs we need with wearable artificial organs are to reduce mortality, improve quality of life, reduce cost, improve access, and simplify care. Uh, this slide uh, synthesizes pretty much uh, a whole number of bad things that happen in patients on dialysis, and uh, we have a roadmap on how to ameliorate or eliminate these uh, uh, 
bad effects that actually impair the life of the patients and reduce quality. Here we have um, a few cells that are a pacemaker. And in the 40s, this was the first pacemaker ever made. And as you can see, it evolved. And uh, this was in the 70s, already we had something like this. And this is the state of the art on pacemakers today. It took from the 40s to today to get to this. On dialysis, we're almost around here as we speak. We haven't moved since then. So if we can miniaturize things, and uh, yes, we can, why can't we miniaturize uh, a dialysis machine that weighs 300 pounds into something small that doesn't use 40 gallons of water per treatment that works on batteries and can be worn on a body. And uh, we actually did that pretty much in the sense that Jesse here, who is no longer with us, was dialyzing in machines that have not changed too much. I took this picture of Jesse. By the way, Jesse became very depressed and uh, finally he couldn't take it anymore and he said, doctor, stop, I want to go, let me go. And he passed. Depression and suicide are very rampant and a significant amount of patients on dialysis uh, will pass because they, don't, they can't handle it anymore. On the other side, we have this picture and this dancing lady has a wearable device that works on batteries on 300 cc's of fluids. If she's not attached to anything. She can move, she can dance, she can do anything. And there's blood running through this device. This is a picture we took in London in the work we did with Dr. Davenport. And uh, basically this is one of uh, three human trials uh, done around the globe uh, where we prove the concept that you can, in fact, miniaturize a dialysis device and make it wearable. We made it work and the data are published in uh, Italy with Claudio Ronco, in London with uh, uh, Andrew Davenport, and in Seattle uh, with Dr. Himmelfarb. And uh, if we made it work in three places around the globe with different uh, researchers, uh, there is no doubt that uh, this uh, concept can, in fact, be made work for the benefit of our patients. So we need basically wearable organs because we have a lot of issues in dialysis and other diseases as well. Uh, we have billions of dollars in expenses. A patient on dialysis, 88,000 a year to the taxpayer, 40 billion in treatment uh, uh, and growing. Quality of life and lifespan are nothing to get excited. Also, uh, as we improve the quality of life and the lifespan in our society, people live longer. And if they live longer, there also are more people around that develop kidney failure, and that impacts this uh, evolving issue. The exorbitant hospital costs make a huge dent in the Medicare budget, and we need to bring those down. We need to increase collaboration between physicians, nurses, engineers, and patients to make this happen. And we need more IT, more artificial intelligence, more nano, and better technology applications for uh, bringing relief to children on dialysis. Children, there are 1,200 children on, dialy on hemodialysis in the United States, and uh, that's an orphan disease. And if you weigh uh, 180 pounds, you have about four or five liters of blood to have extracorporeal blood volume in a dialysis machine. If you weigh 50 or 80 pounds, you don't have that much blood. And dialyzing, doing hemodialysis on a child cannot do PD for any number of reasons when the body size is much smaller becomes a major challenge. 
we, can, we need this uh, help in the military, and we need help in disaster areas. People passed, people uh, lost their lives, and underwent those that remained alive uh, in great misery in Puerto Rico, in Florida, and in Texas with the hurricanes, where there was no fresh water and no energy to keep people on dialysis. And uh, we don't have enough time to discuss that. Uh, there are some military applications that uh, we, it's a little bit too short to discuss, but if you have a field hospital in Bagram or in Iraq, you have a water problem, and it's not that easy to dialyze. So we need a device, perhaps like ours, that works on 300 cc of fluid instead of 40 gallons. And this says it all, the world cannot afford ESRD in its present situation. Um, so we developed the wearable artificial kidney. You saw that lady with the version 2.0. And then we went in the 3.0, which is coming up, and I'll discuss that a little bit in detail in this discussion. Uh, the 2.0 weighted 11 pounds. And uh, patients' preferences, and we conducted studies uh, uh, of uh, the patients' preferences before and after this at human trials, and uh, patients were all very pleased and they liked it, and I'll make some more comments on that. But what they did not like is 11 pounds was still too heavy and was not good enough to walk uh, around and everybody looking at that big thing that that uh, dancing lady had. So it works to prove a concept, but it still cannot go to market. And when you do trials, you learn things, and we did learn things in our last trial, including that we have some technical challenges that we had to meet uh, in order to make this a go into, hopefully, the market. And uh, that's when we decided that the 2.0 proved the concept. It was time to make, leave it obsolete and go to a new model that could do things better. And here's what we did. We still think that the, the belt is the better place in the body to put a dialysis uh, wearable device. And the blood circuit remained more or less the same. In red, blood comes into the device. This is a reservoir with heparin with a little pump. This uh, is a double channel pump. One channel is for blood. Pumps the blood into a small pediatric sized dialyzer and the blood is returned to the patient. So the blood circuit functioned relatively well and we didn't see very many needs to change that one, at least at the present time. And then uh, what we reasoned is, well, there are tasks that the WAC performs on, 20, on 24 hours and must be performed on 24 hours. For instance, physiological removal of fluid over a 24 hour period. If you want to remove too much fluid too fast, we have cramps, we have hemodynamic issues, so it has to be continuously removed. Uh, uremic toxins, the whole uh, group of toxins that have been shown to be noxious, and I'll talk about it a little bit if we have a time, uh, need to be removed over 24 hours. You can't remove enough of those in 12. So we preserve that function. The one or two functions that we saw that could be done from our own data in two human trials, the two functions that both created a lot of weight and could be done in less than 12, 24 hours. In eight, we got enough removal of urea. And also, in our device, the uh, parts that remove urea create most of the weight. So he said, if we could have a night module where the weight is not on the body because the patient is asleep, and we put those functions at night, then we remove enough urea during the night, and during the day, we continue only with those functions that we think need to be removed over 24 hours. And that gave birth to the version 3.0 that has two modules, a night module and a day module. During the night, the diagram here shows that you have 
you have fresh dialysate coming into the dialyzer. There are electrolyte supplements like calcium, magnesium, bicarb, uh, and then it goes into the filter, and then it comes back, and the ultrafiltrate gets part into the bag and part into these sorbents, including the heavy ones that are here that create most of the issue. So we said if we put those for eight hours only in a night mode, and this device can be put at the bedside or in a pillow or even on a teddy bear, then when you're asleep, you're hooked up to this one, and the day module hooks up into this as well. What this does is allow hooking up to electricity and recharge the battery for the next day. In addition to remove urea, and our peer-reviewed data already published in two studies show that this device removes in eight hours all the urea that you need to remove, creating a very good nitrogen balance maintenance. And here is the day, the day uh, dialysis circuit, the daily uh, module. And the daily module has the same blood circuit, but the dialysate has only one cartridge to regenerate the, uh, the dialysate, and it removes creatinine, it removes all the uremic toxins we want to remove. We have data on that as well. So fresh dialysate goes into the, dia into the dialyzer, and then uh, the dirty dialysate goes into one cartridge, not three. It weighs much less, and this allows us to put all this not in 11 pounds, but in only two pounds. And that way we confer to the patient a device that can walk during the day, performing all the uh, functions of uh, the removal uh, of toxins, salt, um, fluid in a physiological fashion. So we do away with problems such as cramps, uh, blood pressure drops, um, salt, salt restriction. This thing removes about 8 to 12, maybe 14 grams of salt a day, depending on the configuration. We tell patients to eat 2 grams a day of salt. When you tell patients you can eat 10 grams if you choose to, because we remove it, you basically change dramatically the quality of life and the freedom of the patients to choose the food that they really want to have. And our data show that, in fact, we accomplished that. So this is the version 2.0 that we did until now, and coming soon will be the 3.0. So what does it do for the patients? When you ask my grandmother, in our tradition, you came to tell her something new happened. She said, is this good for us or bad for us? Is this good for the patients or bad for the patients? So we'll dwell about on, on that particular question. Is this good for the patients, why and how? So I already mentioned that you need to remove blood, uh, fluid that does not come through the urine because there is no urine. And fluid in today's dialysis goes from the interstitial space, the lungs, the leg edema, to the intravascular space, to the dialyzer, and then you remove that very fast, and in, you remove two, three kilos of water in four, or three and a half, four hours, and that causes hypotension and all kinds of other problems, including the fatigue, including the, uh, the cramps, and uh, the need of the patients to go to sleep after uh, four hours of dialysis. So we believe that if we can do this, where we remove water and salt at a physiological fluid removal rate, like 50 to 100 ml per hour, which is what the normal kidneys do, then hypotension will not occur. Uh, this is a slide that says that some of the uremic toxins have been shown to be toxic when they're not bound to albumin or to protein, but when they're free particles. And 
uh, our microbes in the gut make some toxins that the kidneys excrete. Those toxins are swimming in the blood tied to protein, to albumin. And while they are bound, they're not toxic. And there is an equilibrium between this and this. These free molecules are what the kidney removes and excretes. We remove this on dialysis, but we remove it on four hours only, so we don't remove enough, because we need to give time for these bound molecules to slowly do the transit. So if you do it over 24 hours, then you remove effectively all the removal of toxins you need to accomplish. But if you do it only for four hours, that's not gonna happen. And by the way, the, uh, this is a, not data from our lab, but it's been published quite a while ago, and there are many more uh, studies on these toxins. So when we compare the clinical benefits uh, of the wearable versus the ones on hemodialysis. So we said filtration time. If you wear it 24-7, then you're filtering the blood like the kidneys do 24-7, 168 hours a week, not 9 to 12 hours, which is what we do today. And believe you me that if you remove fluids and filter blood for 9 to 12 hours, some bad things happen because it's not enough time. I already discussed fluid removal. You can't remove four liters or three liters in four hours without having to pay a hefty price, and we pay, our patients do. I also would like to remind you what was discussed before about the high mortality of the weekend break where we have more fluid accumulated because it was not removed in a timely fashion, and all that hopefully we would resolve. Phosphorus removal. So the other day, a couple of drug reps walk into my office and say that I should be prescribing this phosphate binder or another phosphate binder, and I asked it, it's a question, how much does it cost? And it turns out that we taxpayers pay about $1,000 a month per patient for phosphate binders. Now, if you have 600,000 of those times 12 a year times 1,000, you come with about five, six billion a year with a B, phosphate binders alone. This technology does away with phosphate binders. We have ample data, we published that several times, and there are other publications that show that prolonged daily, more frequent, as long as possible dialysis actually produces normal or even low phosphate. So phosphate binders would go away, and just on this one thing we would be saving in the United States about five billion a year easy. Also, you do away with the pill burden. Patients have to take 20 pills a day, 12 pills a day. It's a burden. It's not easy life. And last but not least, they can eat things that contain phosphorus, like cheesecake. <laughs> Potassium. Our data show that we maintain homeo complete homeostasis of potassium levels regardless, regardless of what patients ate. So we gave them the Coca-Cola, the mashed potatoes, anything they wanted. No hyperkalemia. So if you maintain electrolyte homeostasis and you remove the barriers, then people can have a glass of orange juice. A chronic dialysis patient that does three treatments a week will have a couple of glasses of orange juice and a dish of mashed potatoes and is dead from hyperkalemia. That will be gone. I already spoke about salt overload going away and I don't need to remind this audience what that does to hypertension, heart failure, and all other problems that come with salt overload. 
if you ask patients what they, what, what they want besides to have their life, their life back, in one sentence, they want their life back. Well, one of the things they also want is independence from painful insertion of needles. You can't have a wearable device with a shunt, with two needles held uh, in place with a piece of adhesive tape. So we have to use a catheter. Now, catheters have their problems. I can talk about that for a while, and we deal with those. But what we also know is that there will be no more needle sticks, and patients do not like needle sticks. I never heard of anybody that celebrates having to get two needles in his arm. Hospitalizations, hopefully, if we do away with salt overload, there will be no pulmonary edema. There will, no, no be, there will be no extra ER visits of patients with pulmonary edema on a Sunday night. We can reduce the amount of surgeries, we can reduce the amount of heart attacks, and there's going to be, basically, this device that we're talking about will create a need for a lot of clinical research to evaluate the uh, effects of, uh, of this treatment on actual clinical impact on the way people live. Uh, we already mentioned this, so I said I'm gonna stop before dinner, so. Uh, this was the first trial. I'll, give, I'll show you some pictures of how this went on. This was the first trial. We didn't have problems with consent on this particular patient. And uh, this sees the first walk in the breadboard in our lab in those days in Cedar sinai This lovely gentleman here is walking around in Italy in our trial in Vicenza. And um, many of you may have heard the story, but it's worth repeating it. This lovely guy was the first patient ever to wear, wear our device. And uh, he lay down on, on a sofa and we put the device on and starts walking around. He's very happy and uh, everything works. So he says, I want to go to the bathroom. And I was a little worried. I said, yeah, you can go to, go to the bathroom but the door stays open. So the poor gentleman sits down and has a bowel movement. And he says, can I have a phone? We give him a phone, he calls his wife and says, guess what I am doing while having dialysis? <laughs> so uh, th this really happened. And uh, it is funny at the beginning, but think if you are doing dialysis in a dialysis center with 20 people around and a lot of nurses and you have no privacy, and you ate something wrong and you have some diarrhea and you hook to the machine. So it is not as funny for these patients as we think it is. Uh, the lady in, the, in this part, this is mother and daughter polycystic kidneys, mother with the current washing machine, daughter wearing our device. These are pictures from uh, patients that did the trial in Seattle. And uh, this is a very proud lady that, I'm sorry, that she was the first female in the US to wear our device. And she's hooked, this is a version two with a lot of monitoring stuff on it. But uh, she is walking around with the device. Charlie here is a, um, a retired Boeing engineer and uh, you can see him in YouTube uh, telling his own story. He put himself on his own, we didn't even ask. And for this lady, the dream was fries, Coca-Cola, and ketchup. And this guy enjoyed bananas and cheesecake. So um, I don't know if I'm, how I'm doing with time then uh, we hope to do away with ambulances and uh, there will be less money spent because of no phosphate binders, more dialysis time, less staff, less EPO, 
Les Peel Burden. Um, some of my favorite quotes, the bottom one is, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. That was by the chairman of IBM. Uh, and uh, a Roman guy once said that inventions have long since reached, and I see no hope for further developments. And this is not my project. This is a project of a lot of people that over the years have been helping, supporting, and participating. Uh, and there's many more. I just don't have room for that. So thank you so much. And uh, I'm done. i like to open the session for uh, questions and answers. So if you have a question, please use the mic in the center aisle. Uh, but first, I'd like to thank all the uh, speakers for their excellent presentation and all the information that they imparted. Uh, I'd like to ask the inventors, um, is there a timeline when you think that your product will uh, come to market? Um, Dr. Guru and Dr. Roy? Uh, there is a timeline. Um, we estimate that if we have enough money, and we don't right now, uh, it would be about two years from the time we have the funds available until we can offer this in the version, uh, the last version to the public. Uh, this is my time to say perhaps that I am singing the praises of the FDA because they've been very supportive. We have no regulatory obstacles as such. That doesn't mean we're not going to do what needs to be done, but they've been very supportive and there's no other obstacles except the funds to execute this. Sure. So we are, we are going for an implanted device, which is obviously a higher threshold of safety and effectiveness that must be demonstrated. Having said that, we've worked closely with our colleagues at the FDA to come up with a roadmap of the tests we should do to move towards approval. And the very first test is showing that the safety of the filter component uh, is demonstrated in vivo. And as the first step in, in towards that goal, we hope to test that in an external circuit, hopefully later this year. Uh, and then based on those results, we'll then move towards an implanted study, and then later on followed by a, a uh, cell therapy. The short answer is, you know, uh, we're going to start the clinical trials. It's probably a series of clinical trials, and then it's going to be a question of the market and the business that makes it a product. So we as academic uh, innovators can move it to a certain stage, but we'll need the business community to make it available to the patients. Okay, thank you. Please identify yourself and your sure. question. Thank you for arranging the uh, forum and inviting especially patients like me, to get a knowledge of what's happening in the uh, nephrology field. I have one question for the bio-implantable device. Are there metrics developed to estimate the mean time between failure? Because components do fail over a period of time. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you're asking a question about mean time between failures and a more likely, you know, how often might a patient need to come in uh, so that their device is maintained. So to that end, we've actually partnered up with the Home Dial Dialysis United and AIKP to do a patient preference survey. Uh, the results are not yet finalized, but our goal is that um, if we have a device that allows for periodic maintenance, which means exchange of the filters or the cells on a period of one to two years, it becomes feasible for a device that patient, a substantial plurality of the patients would want. So in short, I think a good target for us to start off with is one to two years, although the goal is to extend that to a longer time frame for periodic maintenance. Thank you. perfect height for me. Hi, I'm Michael Middleman. Um, I'm from Philadelphia. Um, I have had three transplants over the years, uh, dialysis a number of times. So I flew in from Europe last night specifically to get back to, to here today. So um, my question for you guys is, uh, is, there's two really, one of which is, do we worry about 
uh, the continued and then future use of data and patient data when we look to do these sort of predictive mechanisms. Um, I know that the folks yesterday are talking about it, new methods of chronic kidney disease. Um, I worry about it, so I wondered if you could address that briefly. Um, and then the second one being um, a lot of this depends on the continued, uh, and I'm glad there's so much patient involvement now, but it depends on the continued ability for us to be a part of the conversation. Um, and I'm thankful that I could be here. Um, but so at, at what point do we think, um, for those of you on the table, we rely so heavily on patients um, taking surveys, patient preference surveys, I get them from AAKP, uh, the things with CMS and, and FDA. Uh, at what point do we reach a, do you think, a, a turning point where maybe um, that becomes too challenging for patients to sort of continue to give up their time um, freely um, and, and to be able to attend and, and participate? Um, I'm, I'm happy to address the first part of your question, Michael, sure. um, and I can maybe speculate on the second part. But sure. um, So I think the first part is around data. Um, and I, I think, so there's a lot of concerns around data, um, not just privacy, but security. Um, there's also a lot of potential uh, real upside around being able to use the data in the right way. Um, and so w one great example was an article in yesterday's Wall Street Journal where the Montefiore hospital system has imp implemented artificial intelligence to help them predict when someone's going to develop respiratory failure mm -hmm. in hospital. And it was way better than um, a clinician's um, assessment of when that could happen. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just one example. I think you could run through hundreds and potentially thousands of different applications. So I think at some point, um, we always have to ask our, ourselves the question, what's the potential downside? How do we um, protect uh, patients mm -hmm. on everyone involved with an ecosystem around that downside? And that's where the regulators also need to, to come in and help us with that. Um, but my personal feeling is the upside could be enormous to deliver better care to patients. Yeah, I, I know ISPOR is happening, and they're talking a lot about real, real, world, real world evidence, and I'm um, seeing it on social media, yeah. And then I think your second question, if I interpret it right, is more around patient <coughs> fatigue mm -hmm. um, in being involved in, um, in um, some of these surveys, perspectives, um, and, and I, I, I think that needs to come from, from the patients. Um, I mean, obviously, I think it's something that we should all be aware of. Um, but I think the patient should let us know when and where there's a problem. Great. Thanks. Thank you. We'll take two more quick questions. Rohan Paul from GW Transplant. Um, this is a question for Dr. Roy. Um, congratulations for your work. Um, in any um, device, there's obviously a concern for infection. So my first question was how um, vulnerable or resilient is the membrane to bacterial colonization or infection? And the other question was about blood flow. Many of our transplant candidates are not eligible for a transplant due to poor cardiac function. And so I was wondering how accommodating the membrane is for people that might have poor ejection fraction or not good systolic function. So I can only speculate, obviously. And to the infection question, I think, uh, like any implanted device, um, there's that risk uh, of infection. And we take a lot of our learnings from the community of MCS, so artificial hearts and VADs, and the work that has been done to address infection risks there. So having an implanted device without an external connection probably has some advantages, but there's still an inherent challenge. And we have to practice sterile technique, the right coatings, and so forth. In terms of uh, blood flow, I think these are low flow devices in general. Um, our, uh, in one of our uh, publications, we went through the design uh, philosophy of what we're trying to achieve, and the idea was that we, a target rate of 30 milliliters per minute of GFR would probably be sufficient to get people off dialysis and provide them a quality of life that was manageable and, um, and that could be um, uh, helpful and enjoyable. So we're thinking in terms of flow rates on the order of a few hundred milliliters to up to a liter. In the preclinical studies, we've gone as high as a liter to a, a 1.5 liters per minute. Uh, but clearly, if there's cardiac compromise, 
uh, that's something that has to be taken into account. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to thank the panelists once again for an excellent presentation. I'm going to turn this over back to Richard to introduce the next uh, AAKP moderator. Thank you, Dr. Liu.